So starting, first the chances of LND, right? So here's the actual first commit in LND. It was October 27th, 2015. And this is basically like when I was in school still, uh, you know, finishing up school, and this is basically mostly doing my winter break, right? So this is kind of like the first like major sprint that we had in, in terms of like code. We talked about like, you know, like what, what language we're using, uh, as far as like the licensing, kind of like architecture of the daemon, and then so on. And uh, some fun facts actually, it's like the original name of LND was actually called Plasma, right? But before we uh, <laughs> before we made it open, so open source, like this was like in January 2016, we named it to LND because it was like, you know, we use BTCD, so we made it more kind of like, you know, BTCDE, LND being like network gaming. So like, yeah, I was kind of sad I lost the name out to, you know, other things that came afterwards, but yeah, I was first. I, we had the last one, so uh, go wrong from there, right? So then I ended up starting to work on LND full time in uh, June 2016 when I graduated uh, from school. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I can do this, you know, Bitcoin stuff full time now. And then at that point, like, if you look at the kind of like uh, contributor uh, history on GitHub, you see like a big spike afterwards, basically. It was like, you know, winter break and then nothing, you know, school, finals, TA, you know, grading, and then boom again. And then, then we started off uh, doing things seriously. As far as the like, release timeline, we had LND 0.1 initially in January 2017, and that was basically, uh, oh, we have a thing, it mostly works. I think by, by then you could basically, you could send payments, you couldn't you could connect to peers, there was no multi-hop, there wasn't really pathfinding, uh, you didn't handle any of the cases like that. Then we had 0.2, 0.2 had a little bit more improvements, you know, we could do things like actually send payments across other peers, we had some basic pathfinding. Uh, then there was 0.3, like most, most recently, for uh, this recent one, now it's kind of like a little more like fully fledged, right? We could do multi-app payments. We had you know some, but not all of the kind of like on-chain contract handling. We didn't have uh, you know a little bit more. We had like autopilot there for the first time, which kind of like this automation system within LND to automatically establish channels. And then now we're here because LND O.4. Oh, that says alpha there. That should be beta, not. <laughs> I guess I copy pasted it, but that's fine. Uh, but yes, like this is like the first beta release, and uh, you know, LND O.4 matters because this is actually the first release that uh, supports mainnet, right? So beforehand, we had only test and sentiment support. People got really, really excited and did mainnet anyway. Like earlier on, we were kind of like, oh, we're going to make breaking changes. Don't do it yet. Uh, so then we kind of like discouraged people from up updating, updating because uh, you know we had planned breaking changes in the future. So we knew that if you had channels, you have to close them all down. And there were some little mishaps that people you know not kind of uh, kind of like uh, getting that communicated, right? Most of the work within uh, you know uh, 0.3 uh, alpha and 0.4 beta was mostly kind of around like security and fault tolerance. So before you couldn't, there were no backups at all. You know the thing like if it like crashed, there was, everything was in memory. But if you got like you know four HLCs, you couldn't resume any kind of like multi-step uh, you know contract handling or anything else like that. But all of that's been taken care of. It's now released, and you know it was the first release that we could kind of feel comfortable with people running on mainnet, right? Before otherwise, like I'd be like nervous, like oh, oh you don't open the channel, like oh, but now it's kind of like okay because we you know we have a pretty good degree of confidence that people that you know things go down, LND will actually correct itself, and also if it ever crashes, then it's able to resume where it was and actually you know continue to that state, which is like a pretty big milestone in order to make things happen. All right, so uh, LND. So like, you know, with LND, we use Go primarily. It's kind of like the first class, uh, you know, it's actually pure Go, right? And Go has several advantages, uh, you know, meaning that, like, uh, you know, I think it's a pretty good kind of, uh, you know, choice for, like, creating concurrent software in general. And usually the question is, like, you know, why are you using Go? Why not, like, C or C++ or Rust or whatever else? And, uh, you know, I think these are some of the reasons why we use it. And uh, so far, I think we've had pretty good uh, developer uptake. People, you know, typically find that the code base is pretty easy to jump into because the language is, like, kind of familiar, right? If you know C, you know Python, you kind of know Go, it looks the same. Maybe there's some weird keywords, but for the most part, it's pretty straightforward, right? So one good thing about Go, it has like very, very good concurrency support, right? So LND itself is very, very concurrent, parallel, you know, by nature with the architecture itself. And uh, the main things that we use uh, within Go to use this are called uh, channels of Go routine, right? So Go routine is basically kind of like a lightweight thread. It's like a green thread, if you know that, from like Python to Greenlets. And then it has these things called channels, right? So you have these, you know, yeah, these threads, and they can communicate with each other using channels. So I can like send messages back and forth pretty easily. And if you can think about this, this makes it pretty easy to kind of like create these kind of like concurrent uh, architectures, right? So maybe you have like a producer saying some thing to be a producer and a consumer. And they, you have a pipeline going down, and you can kind of like do subscription pretty easily. It's used very heavily throughout the entire uh, you know, code base stuff. The other thing is, uh, Go has very, very excellent tooling, right? Like, it's like, I think the tooling is maybe a big, big what makes it in terms of like assistance programming language, right? So, where Go is very, very easy to just do like CPU and heat profiling. So, like, I basically on the weekends, I profile, right? I profile, you know, do memory, you know, I, I do some kind of like CPU profiling. It makes it very easy with uh, something called pprop, and you can also actually remotely hit a server to get like a Go routine done, things like that. So, it makes it easy to kind of do things like that. It actually, has a racing detector, right? So, if you ever, uh, you know, done concurrent programming, you know, racing missions suck, they're super hard to find, and like, you know, they're kind of like the phantom bug, which you can't always, always replicate, right? But uh, Go has a thing called Race Detection Tech, which slows down the program maybe like 150x. 
lets you kind of catch all these issues, right? So uh, we always run our tests with this, and you can even run it and develop it locally. So if it catches one, it will basically just stop everything and then dump the, the you know the stack. It's like, oh, concurrent write on map, or oh, like you know read after write uh, dependency type of thing. And the other cool thing, it basically has something called GoFMT. And I think about GoFMT is that everyone's code looks the same, right? So this, this matters a little bit more in kind of like larger projects. We don't have to worry about like, oh, do we do a semicolon and then the brace, or like a brace with the you know like with the space? Do we do like a new line? Basically, you write your code, you do GoFMT, and then boom, everything looks the same. This is good because you can you know kind of get through with everyone's code. Everyone's code looks the same, so there's no kind of like arguing in the code review about like, oh, what's the proper code style, whatever else, all built in automatically. Uh, the other thing is the standard library is like super, super expensive, right? The standard library has like, you know, everything, every crypto thing you need, has networking, and you know, it has like its own SSH information in pure Go, it has like TLS, has basically everything you ever need in order to do anything, you know, Bitcoin later or constant programming. The cool thing, it basically produces these technically like binaries by default, and this is nice because I can just like have the binary and take it anywhere, right? The other cool thing about this, I can cross compile super, super easy for any platform at all. And uh, usually you never even need to modify your code, basically. If you write it and compile, it's going to run on that other system. The times you have things around maybe like, you know, 32 for 64 bit, but those really aren't that uh, substantial. And so, like, you know, I have like a release group that, you know, compiles for like, you know, like MIPS, like PowerPC, like BSD, just everything pretty easily, which is nice. My, you know, my probably like favorite, most favorite thing about Go is that it's a very, very simple language, right? So it's like language itself is very, very simple parsing-wise. You don't even need a table to actually parse it. And as a result, you can kind of like focus on the problem at hand. Rather than like, oh, am I using the proper, you know, like sealed class trait, like uh, monad? No, 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 it's like there's nothing, right? Like you just basically write your code. It's very, very simple and like you focus on the problem at hand. And the final thing that we really like about Go, this is a really good set of libraries called BTC Suite. Right, so this is written in Go as well, and they're basically anything you need to do in Bitcoin, this library has. So things like you know, signing transactions, parsing things, addresses, uh, you know, peer to peer network. You know, so LND is mostly composed of the libraries that uh, interact with BTC Suite, right? So anytime we need to actually interact with the chain, we're calling out to BTC Suite itself, right? So I feel like these, this set of kind of uh, you know, uh, capabilities made Go and also Go in the concept of Bitcoin kind of like a very good choice to, for implementing uh, today with LND. All right, so now the architecture of LND. So like LND kind of has like a pretty, pretty particular architecture and we try to like maintain this whenever we're doing and things like code review, writing new subsystems, right? So for the most part, like LND is composed of a set of kind of like independent subsystems, right? And these subsystems run, run concurrently. Like we talked about before, they use Go routines within the code base itself to run in isolation, they run in parallel, but then they use channels to make everything with each other, right? So this is pretty good because when you're reading and you're one of these subsystems, you know that only it can mutate its own state, right? There's no other thing where you have like race conditions on the grab mutex and all of a sudden like, you know, the state's inconsistent. Instead, in order for me to modify my own state, I need to get a message from my else. I get a message, I parse a message, I apply it to my state, and then maybe I send a reply back as well. So this is really cool because now you basically have like a distributed system within the uh, actual process itself, right? So we, you know, times we have to do things kind of like, um, you need to be able to ensure that you can handle kind of like duplicate message delivery as well because if something like, you know, restarts and comes back up, you need to be able to handle that message, you know, uh, being received in a duplicate manner. It's kind of similar to the way people implement kind of like message queues, and regular distributed system, things like that, right? And the main thing is kind of like this like main tenant, like a problem with Go, is you don't communicate by sharing memory, instead of sharing memory by communicating, right? So this means you don't have like a single shared like map that everyone has a log to and everyone communicating off, right? Instead, maybe you have that map inside this own Go routine, people send it, uh, you know, serialized message to actually mod modify the state of it, and then you can actually maybe send them the message to actually read the current state of it itself. And that by itself makes, you know, concurrent programming very, very easy to reason about, right? Because otherwise you're kind of like, okay, did I have, like, the main lock and, like, you know, the other lock on the entry? Did I, do I have a re-entry lock? Like, you don't have to worry about that. You basically just send a message and you come back and you can get the message and go on and then do things uh, on its own. The other cool thing about this is that like we can implement crash recovery specifically between each subsystem by itself in isolation, right? So each each subsystem basically knows like maybe has like a particular log or has kind of like um uh, you know some like um you know the last message we're going to send or, or things that we're going to get get back. So on restart we can as a result we can basically test um, you know fault tolerance very very specifically in a particular subsystem using unit tests, right? Rather than just kind of like hoping you know hey hopefully it all works, right? But no, instead we can kind of like really focus and know you know what messages we need to be sending inside and, and out and out of the subsystem to ensure it's actually properly fault tolerant. But the cool thing is like each subsystem actually has its own logger, right? And this is really, really good for debugging because you're like, oh, like what happened to my channel? Oh, let me like look at the subsystem that just does channel, channel updates, right? Or like what message came in? Okay, now I can like crank up just like the peer-to-peer -peer messaging uh, log and things like that. So this is really cool because, you know, like me, myself, I have like a very particular like logging setup. I, I have things that I know like are spammy, I turn those off. I have other things that maybe, you know, a little more important like things around like, you know, handling states or messages that are coming in from the other, uh, other like peer things like that. 
Another important part on these, that anything that's actually chain specific is all abstracted away, right? And, and this is good because this is how we're able to support things like, so right now LND supports BTC, uh, Bitcoin D, and Neutrino as a backend, right? But you can also like write your own. If, you, if you're a company and you basically have like your own API, you can basically plug into that backend if you want to, right? And this is, <laughs> yeah, I think I was like, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's pretty easy because uh, you know, these are kind of like the main interface that we have. First one is Chain Notifier. Chain Notifier basically does things that we do all the time, like, you know, let me know what's been confirmed, let me know when an output's been spent, and then also let me know when a new block comes in, right? And if you know things about like how channels work, you basically use those three things all the time, right? Next thing is the signer. The signer basically handles, well, you know, signing. So it needs to know how to do things like, uh, you know, uh, the, seg the segwit by seg hashing. It needs to know how to do like properly witness and things like that. And that's cool because because it's abstracted away, right now it's all done in the process, but you know, later on maybe in a, like an own dedicated hardware device, right? Or it could even be in like a remote server which has other kind of like access control policies to prevent, you know, people just like doing kind of like, you know, right signing stuff. We have something called the keychain and secret keychain, and those themselves handle basically driving the keys in a particular manner. So basically, we can even have this like be even more segregated, something that can just like give us addresses and keys and public keys for using with the contract, and then for actually signing them. And then finally we have blockchain.io, which basically, you know, you can read the blockchain, what's the block, uh, you know, give me the transaction, there's a thing on the and things like that, right? Cool part about this, you can basically swap them out very, very easily. And because of the abstraction that we have our unit test set up and the integration test, we just know that we can kind of assert the equivalence of all of these different interfaces together and ensure that okay, Bitcoin D works as well as you know BTC and other things. But as always, you know, there's maybe edge cases and things like that in between them. All right. Did this turn out well? It's kind of a kind of intense. <laughs> maybe it's like I, I have the uh, architecture diagram from maybe like two years ago, and it wasn't like even it didn't really look close to this, right? Uh, maybe I could blow it up a little bit, but uh, I hope you guys can like squint and maybe look at it uh, later on. It's all right. But, <laughs> so the way it is, like anytime there's an arrow, that either means there's kind of like a direct dependency, or it's like passing a message to another subsystem itself, right? To so the very bottom, we have Lightning P2P network, right? And then above that, we have this thing called Brontide, and Brontide is basically this like crypto messaging layer that we have on top of, uh, you know, we use it within Lightning. There's been something called Noise, made by Trevor Perrin, who works on like Signal and like WhatsApp and things like that. Very, very good kind of like modern messaging protocol with, you know, very modern crypto, has some cool things around the can chips to ensure that like you know we have certain properties like identity hiding and like non replay and like zero register times things like that. Then you right above that we have LMIR which does all the framing so like encoding and decoding any messages. And the cool part about the way this is set up is that like if you want to just like take our code base because everything here is like its own individual package and just connect to the network and listen to you know what's going on, you can do that, right? Because everything is very, very you know modular and abstracted away and it actually has its own nice sort of unit test as well. Right above the uh, LMIR we have the peers. So this is basically you know reading write messages from different Different peers. Then we have the server, which itself is kind of like you know hook handling the uh, the state of all the peers itself. And above that we have the RPC server. So RPC server, RPC server is pretty you know central part of LND itself, and that's where anytime you interact with any application, they're going to the RPC server, right? So the RPC server uses something called macroons for authentication. We'll get into a little bit later. So anytime uh, you know a uh, so macroons are basically this kind of like bearer credential, right? So typically you have maybe have like username and password. You basically have the username and you, you look up kind of like you know what can they perform this like massive list, kind of access control list. Instead we do something called uh, it's, it's a, we actually have a credential system, right? So I can give you a credential that says you can only make new addresses, right? And I give this to the RPC server and it says, oh, you tried to make a channel? No, that's disallowed, right? But then I can make this address and I can take this uh, you know, new address back and say, you can only make new pure you know, segwit, segwit addresses, right? And then you can't make you know, nets to a stage or anything else like that. So those, those capabilities that you can basically delegate uh, back room, but then also kind of attenuate it down. And this is nice because if you're ever sending an application on top of LND, you can kind of like partition all your boxes and give them only the responsibility that they need, right? So you, know, you can make channels, you can listen to brand voices, and you can send payments. And that, that's pretty good because from a perspective kind of like, you know, compartmentalization and like having, you know, kind of like a separate responsibility you know, amongst all the uh, different systems itself. Now, to unpack rooms, we have gRPC, which we use for our P server itself. And we have a REST proxy, uh, which is basically what most people you know, communicate with on the daily itself. And then if we move over to the right a little bit, uh, we have the gossiper right over to the right of the server. So this is basically you know, dealing with kind of like exchange information for all the different channel peers, kind of like seeing what's going on as far as like uh, you know, new channel, things like that. But that you have the router. So the router you know, hooks directly into the uh, gossiper because maybe it's getting you know, new channel now that's like committed to the state, routing the channel DD. Then we have the HTLC switch, which is kind of like the forwarding fabric of LND, right? So this is like the whole kind of like you know, payments as package thing, where it's basically like has a set of like channels, which are all links, and it's basically handling the, the capabilities forwarding them in and out. And kind of get into that a little bit later. And then moving up, uh, you know, wrapping up a little bit too. We have the signer, the key room right, right above that, who hooked into the funding manager, right? So the funding manager handles basically how do we do, how do we make new channels, right? So it basically walks the state machine of like, okay, I sign, you know, the uh, funding transaction, so the equipment transaction, like gives them broadcast, what goes along with that, and that hooks into above uh, the main like three interfaces, wallet controller, chain notifier, and blockchain.io, 
as long as that we have new types of nursery. So this, ever, this comes into place whenever you have kind of like a time lock alpha, right? So what it does is basically babysits these outputs until maturity. Once they're mature, you know, CSV or CLTV, uh, relative to absolute time lock, and it can then like actually sweep those back into, into the wallet, right? So as a result, because we have that kind of like reasonable compatibility we can use for any of the contract in the future, then we have the contract court. This contract court is where disputes happen, right? So if there's any case where like for some reason someone broadcasts a prior state, or we need to go to change like time lock something else, the contract court handles that and basically communicates to the nursery, you know, so like it may be the case that, oh, I, I have an HCLC, it timed out, so now I need to broadcast, and I give that to you, you take to the nursery, the nursery like, you know, walks over it until, uh, you know, maturity, maybe it's gonna be like 100 blocks, then passes the back over back to the wallet, right? And then, uh, final thing is the breach arbiter. And the beach arbiter is kind of like its own section. This is basically where like, you know, justice, uh, you know, gets dispatched at times. And uh, by justice, I mean, you know, because the contract basically has kind of like these stipulations where if you ever do this, I get all the money. If that happened, the breach arbiter gets notified by chain notifier, you know, broadcasts the transaction, writes the disk, and then gives it to the nursery maybe to put some time logs. But uh, yeah, that's kind of like general architecture of the way things are right now. And this was a lot simpler in the past. Maybe like a few of these subsystems came up in you know the past like year or so, once we kind of like you know we talked a little bit and realized that we want a little more flexibility in certain areas. I think I like I think they're pretty good as of now. And you know they are isolated, have their own sort of test, which makes things easier to reason about. All right, so let's talk about like it's kind of like an application platform, which is you know have some custom uptake recently. So the cool thing about Lightning is basically that's kind of like this new development platform of Bitcoin, right? Before maybe as a developer you need to know about like oh you know how do I sign a UTXO, what's the sequence value, you know uh, what's like how do I actually even do signatures, what's the sig hash, things like that, and that can really kind of get uh, you know intense, right? And that, that kind of I think you know often people actually developing on Bitcoin itself because uh, maybe things were that well documented, but also um, you just kind of seem like kind of overwhelming itself, right? And uh, the other thing is that with Lightning itself. Now, because we have this like you know much more streamlined API, it's actually like another layer, and because we have that other layer, we kind of abstract away from any, any, all the other like, lower level details, right? When I open a channel, like you don't even want to know all the steps below that, right? There's like a bunch of things going on, like keys, signing, you know, HTLCs and everything else. But if you you open a channel, and I can be so it's much more simpler API. Just less, this lets things kind of like you know doing doing things like you know metering for uh, for services. Or maybe like you know I'm paying, you know, I'm like walking somewhere outside, and I can hook into someone's like in a router, and I can pay them you know via VPN servers to actually like, connect to the router, and maybe like you know get Wi-Fi and like find my cab or something like that. I can do things like you know faster processing transactions. So we did like a demo, kind of the demo this like maybe like last October, where we showed the ability to like swap between Bitcoin and Litecoin like, you know, instantly, right? It's a pretty cool use case because otherwise I you know trust an exchange, maybe I do it on chain that takes like you know 30 minutes, 20 minutes, and instead that can be itself. And uh, so we've been calling these like laps. It's kind of like a play on like daps. You know, it's kind of like a, like a tech thing, like a play on words. But it seems to be catching on now, so maybe people you know, are getting into that themselves. So LED itself, like if you go back to that other diagram, we kind of like architect this to make you know development a little bit like easier, right? So we want it to be kind of like a platform where people make you know, different applications on, where people you know integrate uh, you know exchanges and like merges and other things. So we kind of like uh, that's one of the first we kind of like sat down and thought about in terms of like design of it itself. So one of the main things that we use is gRPC. So gRPC, if you guys don't know, is basically something uh, it was actually dealt with internally within Google called Steppy, but then they open sourced it called gRPC instead. So like anything that within Google basically uses something that's very similar to gRPC. It uses protobufs. If you all know, don't know, basically it's like binary solution format. So you can basically have like a, like a def uh, definition of a message, and that composes into like any language, right? And almost any of those languages, you can use that same you know struct or like dictionary or whatever else in that language. And the cool thing about this, so we use is HTTP2. So this uh, lets us basically like, you know have one single connection that multiplexes a bunch of other different messages between themselves. And this is cool because now like you know you don't have to basically like create use like a special SDK or hit like a REST thing. You can basically like you know code in your own language, right? So you're in Python, like you know you basically have a generator, you're iterating all this stuff, you know, like you're sending messages, or you know, maybe in Swift, you know, like you're doing this in iOS. And because of that, you can kind of like focus and integrate this like very deeply into your business logic rather than like having, okay, I'm talking to L and D and I'm doing my record program, they're kind of a little more integrated together. And the other cool thing about it basically has like streaming RPCs. So I can basically you know have one single connection to get notifications like, okay, let me know every single time a payment is settled, right? And I can you know have like a, a callback that maybe like hits off some web sockets and like a JS and like kind of do like things together. Or I can do things like uh, you know notifying when the channels are being opened and closed. But generally we see a lot of people build you know many applications on this, like you know, people build like explorers. Uh, you know, different, uh, we've got y'alls actually, like one of the most popular, uh, you know, apps like earlier in the day, hlc.me, so we've seen like a very, very big community around, uh, you know, one of the applications we're really super excited. Yeah, the CEO of y'alls here actually, so, uh, <laughs> Alex, yeah. And the other thing that we have, we have a REST proxy. So maybe you don't want to use gRPC, maybe you like, maybe you're not supported, maybe you just kind of like, you know, you like typing like raw HTTP queries in the command line using Telnet, you can use this instead, right? So basically all this sets of proxies over to the gRPC server, and it's done using JSON. And it's pretty easy, it's like here's a good example of me, you know, querying for the uh, balance of my channels, right? So using either of these modes, depending on the application, um, uh, you know, kind of like, um, uh, way before application wise, you can use either one of these. Once again, we have like runes. We talked about this a little bit before, but like uh, because you have these bare credentials, so right now we basically we have like one app in that room basically does you know uh, read and write. We have a 
background reader in the back room, so we can give this out to someone, they can you know, pull up the channels, and then we have like an invoice back room. So the invoice back room is cool because now you can have like a survey that accepts payments on Lightning and can't do anything else, right? So even, even, now that, even if that server is compromised, all they can do is like make invoices and make addresses, right? And like, you know, cause like, you know, invoice inflation or something, which doesn't really uh, affect you that much, right? But, uh, so we have some other cool features back room that we have yet to implement, right? So we have what, what we call a bakery plan. So what the bank will let us do, I can say, here's Mac Rune. It can only make channels below 2 BTC on Wednesday, right? And the song will take that. You can make a channel below 2 BTC on Wednesday and Friday. You can basically take that down and like have very, very fine grade authentication for your applications, and that's going to be coming soon in uh, future versions of All right, uh, so we also have this pretty cool developer site made by Max. Intern was last summer. Maybe he's not here. Maybe he's here. I guess so. Oh, there he is. Cool. Uh, so this is a pretty, pretty cool site. You can actually see, you know, every single RPC that LND has. And if you look on the top right, we show example code on like, you know, uh, on, the sh on the command line, on Python, and also on JS. The cool thing about this is like automatically generated. So anytime we update the protos, this will also get updated as well. And that's api.lightning.community. I did the wrong link. I'll fix it <laughs> afterwards. But yeah. And then we also have this uh, developer site for LND, uh, which is pretty cool itself. We again made with Max uh, last summer. And this is kind of a target dev that want to like, you know, build an LND. So we have a pretty good overview section that kind of like gets you in the proper like mindset, like application-wise. Like you know, how do I think about Lightning application? How do I think about Lightning? How do I think about you know what's going on in the hood? Kind of like walks you through you know making like the topology, making channel updates, things like that. And uh, also has like a directory of all like the cool like labs we've been working on. We even have a tutorial called like CoinDesk, which basically takes you to kind of like how do you make CoinDesk, but I have like a paywall tour, right? So we have become like, kind of very like hands-on tutorials where developers actually into the development and things like that. And the site itself is open source. If anything's out of date, you can basically you know, make a pull request and then update the site. Or if you want to add like new um, uh, examples, maybe new tutorials in different languages itself, you can do that as well. All right, now we're getting into more a little bit uh, specific stuff like what we're working on as far as safety, uh, you know, with the LND itself. So we have this thing uh, called CyberC. First version is called AEZ. Uh, so one thing with Lightning is that like unlike a regular wallet, we basically have like many, many secret the key we need to drive. Like, right? For a wallet, maybe you just have like, you know, I'm using BIP44, so like I have my accounts and I can like get partitions in them and that's it. But for all for Lightning, you know, for every single contract that we have, we maybe need like five or six different keys. Like right now it would get more complicated in the future, right? So as a result, we are kind of thinking like how do we make sure this actually works? How can we make it deterministic? How can we actually back things up properly? Then we look at these existency formats, right? So everyone knows, you know, BIP39, and that's like was was been out there for a while. But the other thing is that like you know, there's 39, there's, there's other bits like, you know, 43 and like 49 and 44 that talk about kind of like key derivation. But those are like very, very simple and not lightning specific. So we're like, well, I guess we've got to make our own. So we, uh, we kind of did that. But we can, uh, you know, go through kind of like justification of like why we did so. Because, you know, it's kind of, like, you can say it's like pretty big departure away from like the regular industry, PF for 39, why would we make our own teeth on that? So one column for 39 that had no birthday. So, you know, this maybe works if you're hitting like an API, or like, you know, like maybe in, inside or else to actually do a key re rescan. But if I'm on my phone, I don't want to start, you know, scanning from like Genesis, right? You know, I could be like the first big part adopter, right? I could be, you know, like Hal Finney's like future stuff, something like that, right? So we, we, want to, <laughs> we want to avoid and make sure that you don't have to like go uh, all the way back into the chain. But I think it has no version, right? Which means that, like, you know, when I have the seed, how do I know exactly like, how do I drive, drive my new keys, right? I could have, like, you know, Electrum, you know, 2.0, and 10 years later, I'm using, like, Python 3.7, and it's like, well, you know, that doesn't work with, uh, with this prior version. The other thing is that the way they do the, uh, the password, it can actually lead to, like, loss of funds, right? Because you don't actually know if this is the correct password. When they have a feature there where they try to basically have, let you have like hidden wallets, which I think, uh, you know, maybe, uh, depending on the use case, might be actually be that useful. But as a result, if I have my seed with power protected and I put in an invalid password, it doesn't tell me no, that's wrong. It just says, okay, here's your wallet. It could be $5, it could be 20 but now I don't really know what my, what my password was. Another thing, it has a pretty weak, key, uh, weak KDF, right? Like it basically doesn't really do anything in the parameters today and maybe didn't really do much in the past. And it doesn't really tell you how to drop the keys, right? So now I need maybe like have you know uh, you know my wallet and the backup like together, and then hope in the future that you know I can still use Python 2.4 when we're on like Python 5 or something like that, right? So instead we created something called uh, AZ. AZ is kind of like the first instantiation of something we call like this like Cypher Seed uh, family itself, right? So if you look on the right, um, the top right, you can basically kind of like see what the format of it looks like. So first thing is we have an external version, right? And then we have a cipher text and a checksum over that cipher text. The external version basically tells you kind of like how to parse everything else. So I didn't write that one. It's basically like one byte right now, and uh, you know we can basically bump that up in the future. This lets you do cool things like let's say we change the KDF in the future, or we change other different parameters. We can you know take an existing seed and offline program, and then basically reconvert it back to uh, a new uh, new format. Then we have a cipher text, right? So the cipher text is actually an, an encryption of this payload above, which is the internal version, which basically tells your wallet how to drive the key. So you know this can be like you know two five seven or whatever else. It knows basically okay, I was using Segwit, you know, in 2018, and I used Windows Key Hash, and I used Nest. 
Peter H. Nation, that's it. We have the birthday, and the birthday is uh, used something called we call Bit Bitcoin Days Genesis, right? So we realized that we didn't really need like a full, you know, eight byte or four byte timestamp. Instead, we can say, okay, you know, Bitcoin was created in 2009. Nothing else matters before then. Let's just like count every single day beyond that. The cool thing about this, we can use two bytes, and we can go up to like 2088 or whatever. So in the future, maybe if we have other, you know, use cases, we haven't used uh, C format, and that can work out itself. Huh? We have like yeah, yeah. a few hundred years, which yeah. is uh, which is our there's, uh, there's also uh, like the salt that's missing. Oh, so, I forgot about the salt. The, uh, next day, <laughs> the whole thing is salted, so it's sort of like a mini password-protected database for your seed. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so there's also well, the password which I then have there. We have finally have the checksum. So again, some interesting traits about this is that like from the get-go, uh, the if you have a password, the uh, seed itself is actually encrypted, right? So I can maybe potentially like leave this out in plain text, and no one can even do anything up from that because it's actually encrypted. They need the passphrase. What I didn't talk about is we have a passphrase, we run that through a KDF, and then we also apply a salt, which is encoded with everything else, and then finally we have the checksum on the outside. So when you're decrypting, you can first you know verify that this is the correct set of words, but then even beyond that, because uh, you know the cybertext uses this AAD, and within it we Use something called AEZ, which is this arbitrary precise block cipher, which means that we can encrypt like a very small amount of data and control exactly, you know, what, without the Mac, which it has, which is kind of like another thing, we can, you know, have like 20 bytes turn to 20 bytes, right? Because it can like actually uh, fix, uh, we can you know, adjust the uh, internal mechanism to basically decide the input itself. And then finally, because it's actually more or less like an AAD, it has a tag inside of it, right? So there's something called a subject, subject expansion factor where we can control how many additional bytes to add onto, which controls basically the, the, the strength of the tag itself. And this is cool because now once I actually you know, know the correct words, if I put in a password, I know it's wrong. I don't have to, so now from now at that point, I don't have to be worried about, you know, kind of maybe like finding out that like, I thought it was the right password, I erased my memory, and then my equals were there. But now this is basically the C format that we use with LND, and uh, it's been working pretty well so far for most people. It's a little bit different um, than what people are used to because you know, it's longer, maybe we used to use 12 words. We also do recommend that you add the, um, uh, the password phrase as well. But more or less, it basically implements all the things that we needed. It has a version, so we basically know, you know how, how can we parse the extra part of it. In the future, if we decide we want like a bigger checksum or we want to use a different crypto system, we can basically have a tool to upgrade the version and then give it somewhere else. It has an internal version to tell you how, how you want, how you actually drive the keys. And it finally has a birthday so I can know with the light client how far back to start looking. And then uh, let's talk about uh, backup side. So uh, we talked about, you know, so the C format is about like how do we read write all the keys that we have, you know, in the past. Now this is basically once I have all the keys, what can I do with them, right? Or even now, once I'm actually live and actually updating my channel, how can I do back what happened to the case of data recovery, right? So you know, uh, one thing to know is that Lightning knows are inherently more stateful, right? We don't just have the keys, we also have the current channel state, right? That basically tells you what what state number are we on, you know, what parameter we're we using, what's my balance, what's your balance, you know, where HTMCs are active itself, and as a result, you basically need the current state and your set of keys, otherwise you can't update, right? If you have your keys, you don't know the state, you can't really do anything. If you have the state and you don't know the keys, then you can't do any updates at all. So instead, we basically have a two-phase approach. The first uh, stage is basically a dynamic channel backup. And you, you guys maybe heard a little bit about this, but we have these things called like watchtowers, right? So the idea is that anytime you make a state update, or maybe you can even batch some of them together, you can export this like state. It's actually, you know, there's different versions, but more or less like the important part is the watchtower doesn't know which channel is being watched, right? You can even now even encrypt that data so it doesn't know, you know, exactly like, you know, uh, what my balances were or the state of it, things like that. I send that state to the private outsourcer, right? And as a result, now I can just know that like, okay, if, if I have like 10 of these in the world, maybe 100 in the world, only one of them needs to actually act properly, right? And then we're actually going to integrate into LND. We're going to actually add them into the routing node itself. So basically, if you're running, uh, you know, routing node, you can also run on these watchtowers. It makes it a little easier in terms of like discovery to have one of these participants. But also now you can say, okay, if I am a, um, a watchtower, then I can, run, I can, I can also have a running node and integrate them pretty closely together. The other thing we'll add is that you'll be able to point them at, at your own instance, right? So let's say I have my node and I have like a you know, computer at home. I'll be able to back up those states to my computer as well in kind of like a redundancy thing, or even like you know have it you know do some like core on like three or five machine like the continents are on board, different availability zones or something like that. Uh, the other thing is that like, we may add something to actually like kind of like batch the updates together because otherwise you can imagine like kind of like a prompt stair where there's like one app, one, one watchtower globally and it gets everyone to update, now basically has like a massive time to side channel attack on the entire network, right? You know, everyone's setting them at any given time. So we're going to add this kind of like batch cybering process within it to basically ensure that, uh, you know, we're giving away like, you know, minor, minor timing of it. Uh, so like, we'll, this will probably be integrated in like major releases of LND. We're going to kind of like, you know, roll it out there first and then likely create the standardized bolt for it in the end. Because it'd be nice if we basically all the nodes, you know, they're all running this watchtower software. They have the exact same messaging, kind of like framing structure, and then now it's very easy for a node just like, you know, you know, spin up, connect some channels, and also ensure that your stage actually dispatch properly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Did anyone see this? Happened like a <laughs> happened like a day, day or so, day or so ago. But uh, so what happened is that like someone. Uh, 
like, you know, they have, they're new, they're like, you know, Kevin Walker, they saw this long question on the left, right? They say, it's like, Channel State number 20 was, was broadcast, you know, Revoke State 20 was broadcast, Revoke Security, you know, remember Peter's doing something sketchy, exclamation marks, and then basically once that's done, it says, uh, you know, waiting for a confirmation, then justice will be served, right? And on the right, you can see uh, the other note, it says, uh, you know, justice has been served, we get our money back. The question is, like, you know, exactly what happened in this case. Well, so what happened was that, like, a, a user had a node implementation, right? And for some reason, they ran into like some issue or they didn't, they, they didn't know how to get past it. So they shut things down and they, and they restored with a prior backup, right? Of, they basically did like a CP that copied their channel state. And as a result, when they came back up, they were on like, you know, state uh, 25, but really they, were, they only had they were state 20. So as a result, if they actually broadcast their transaction, they violated the contract, right? Which means the breach arbiter, which was on the other uh, screen, basically, you know, dispatched justice onto the individual, right? So the question is like, how do you avoid this from happening, right? So if you have your dynamic states, uh, how do you ensure that if I ever have like a backup of the static state, that actually works properly, right? So uh, I'm going to explain that, and we have something called static kernel backups, right? So what we can do is we can actually overload the watchtower with some static kernel information, right? And this information can be basically per state. And I say it's static because you only need this for like when a channel is created, you create one of these, and when it's closed, you can delete it at the end, right? And because it's static combined with the seed format, basically the backup tells you, uh, you know, what keys were used, not the, not the exact keys, but like a key path using the key derivation uh, protocol using the seed format itself, and also tells you information around, you know, kind of like the, uh, the node and things like that. So basically, given your static backup and your seed, you can redrive all the keys you actually need, and then uh, in the case of basically a part of data loss, you can follow this protocol here, right? So first, you, you fetch the backup, and you basically, all right, make sure it's, you know, maybe have a Mac, make sure it's actually correct, things like that. I use my scene backup to redrive all the keys that I actually had. I can connect back to the nodes that I had channels with, and when when they see me in this particular state, they'll activate something we call like data loss protection in the protocol itself, right? So they'll give me some information needed to actually sweep my funds, they close out the channel on chain, and then I can sweep my direct commitment output without any delay, right? So this is kind of like an emergency scenario thing, where if this had been fully implemented, you know, the prior state would have been prevented, because uh, both sides would realize, okay, hey, I'm gonna close channel lock, because they actually lost some data. And uh, you know, we have this plan for the next release of LND as well, because now it's a state where if I have my C and I have one of these backups anywhere, I can get that money back on uh, off-chain, right? So I, I can use my C for all my on-chain transactions and for my off-chain, depending on if I have like, a static backup or dynamic backup, I can also hook into this as well. And uh, you know, well, we plan to basically have some degrees of, like streaming RPCs for every single time you open a channel. You basically grab one of these and like, stick it off so that you can drop it to wherever else to ensure that you, you have all your state properly uh, set up, right? So this, this is basically the safe way to back up on, on Lightning, right? If you ever do anything naive, it's kind of just like copying it and hoping that I have the correct version. Unless you're doing some very you know, complicated you know, version system yourself, uh, this is what you should be doing. And uh, we'll be implementing this uh, in a very soon here within, um, within uh, LMD. And hopefully, again, we'll make this into a bold standard because it would be cool where any node, if they're using the same seed and they have the same you know, backup format, they can you know, connect to anyone other new and actually redrive their keys and get all their money back, which is what we want. You know, we want to like you know collect all the satoshis because in the future, well, you know, satoshis may be important for so. some. Uh, final thing we have within LND is we have uh, now automatic peer bootstrapping. So before with the prior version of LND, you, you have to connect manually to other peers. It's kind of like you know it was, uh, it was a big pin on other individuals because if I if I like don't I'm on IRC, I don't know anyone, I wouldn't be able to actually connect down to anyone else. So instead we basically added this thing called automatic peer bootstrapping, right? So uh, you know one of the important components of this, like you know, within the code itself, you can see like this interface is on the right. We have something called a network peer bootstrapper, right? And it's basically pretty generic. Basically just takes a number of addresses, knows I shouldn't connect to, and then returns addresses that I should connect to itself. And then using this, we can compose this for the multi uh, source bootstrap to basically ensure that we get a uh, number of new peers from a set of distinct um, you know, bootstrappers, right? We want to see bootstrappers because it could be the case that like someone's DNS server goes down, all of a sudden the entire network can actually connect to each other, right? So the current uh, two um, uh, bootstrap vectors that we have from code base, first we have uh, DNS in bolt 10. It's very similar to the way you know, DNS in Bitcoin works, because it's made by Christian Decker who also runs a bunch of you know, Bitcoin uh, DNS stuff. And we have one of those for uh, testnet, uh, Bitcoin mainnet. I was getting one for Litecoin, but I haven't done it yet, but maybe I'll do it after this talk at some point. <laughs> and then also we have channel peer bootstrapping, right? So you only need DNS when you actually connect to the peer for the first time. After you connect, you basically have the set of kind of authenticated sign announcements. The other thing is you only accept announcements from individuals that can prove they have a channel open, right? This avoids kind of a simple scenario where they just like you know flood you and maybe do like a clips attack. Basically, you force them to you know have some skin in the game. You need to have open UTXOs and channels, and otherwise I won't accept your announcement. So result, when you come up, you, you can connect uh, you know, to the DNS resolver, you can get your, your, your initial set of peers, but after that, because you have this data, you can, you can, you're, you're fully uh, uh, you're independent on yourself, you don't require any other server in the future. 
But you know, one thing we're probably going to do in the future as well is add you know, additional versions of bootstrapping, because otherwise we basically want as many redundant subscriptions as possible, and for some reason the DNS server is down, you may have issues actually connecting. One thing we've seen in the wild is that you show DNS resolvers, you know, filter out kind of like our, our larger uh, SRV records, which, you know, because uh, maybe they don't support like, you know, Wumbo UDP, or they don't support TCP resolution, they're able to actually connect, so maybe we'll, you know, investigate some other redundant sources of, of how we can do bootstrapping in a decentralized manner. Uh, final thing that we have here, which is pretty cool, which I could like have an entire other talk on, but uh, you know, in the past, you you basically didn't really know what your data was doing, right? You could like look at the logs, but you wouldn't know if you actually forwarded transactions or things like that. So in this one, we basically have like a uh, time series database of all completed payment circuits, right? And the complete payment circuit is basically when I get like an ad, and you know I forward down the ad HTTP, and I get back the settle one, then you know I get some fee itself uh, now, right? So so we basically store all those persistently on disk. You may want that, you know, for several reasons, as far as like you know financial record keeping and also like different analysis. The cool thing now is I can like look at my node because it's like a time series database and query like oh between two and three p.m. you know there was like lunch on the west coast so I had like a spike in like activities and like that I can look at that and maybe try to analyze and see what's going on but now also I can actually see if my node is running properly right so if you look on the uh, the, the top right you see the, the fee report command so what it does it shows you the fees of all the different channels that you have you can see like I had a fee of like one base mil satoshi and I think it was like 0.001% uh, you know, per uh, such and after that. And it basically has also a breakdown of like the day. So I made seven associates that day. This is like on, on the test now faucet. And then over the past month, I've had 145 associates, which is you know, not, not that bad. And you know, it's like a place right now because fees are very, very low on testnet uh, in particular. And also, you know, there's not like that much traffic going on right now on testnet because we have one like Uber for the most part. And we also have the forwarding history command. And what forwarding history does, by default, it shows you the last 24 hours of the forwarding, right? So you can see, you know, I had uh, two payments in that 24 hour period. One was 2K Satoshi's, the other one was uh, 1700 Satoshi's. I had one Satoshi fee in, in, in all of those, right? And this is pretty cool because now what people can do is they can like actually do real-time analysis on their channels, right? So we have something called autopilot in the daemon right now, where right now only looks at kind of like the static channel information, static graph information to see where they should connect uh, and actually establish channels to. But in the future, we can basically look at the real-time information of all the channels coming in, and then decide, do I want to close out channel B, because channel A you know, is uh, getting me more revenue, but it's almost depleted, so I can close out money over here and spice it to this one over here. Or I can do things like um, you know, ensure that I have like a, par like a proper rebalancing schedule to ensure that you know, I can uh, accept any available flow at a given time. Maybe it's the case that like, I'm getting a lot of like, cancels over here, so I'm like, you know, ramp up my fees to only like, have you know, uh, things that I'd like to go in. So we can do a lot of things in the future we'll hooking into this. People can you know, make like, very cool kind of like pew-pew graphs like, you know, every single payment coming in, when we have a streaming RPC, and uh, things like that. And now uh, it's kind of interesting. Thank you, Lolly. Um, all right, so we're going to jump into, for the last half, we're going to do uh, a couple things mostly related to forwarding HTLCs. Um, most of the work uh, that is going to be talked about here is regarding persistence and safety stuff. Uh, and then at the end, we'll kind of get a little bit more into like, the actual like, onion packets and onion routes. So uh, to start here, this is sort of like a, uh, a very high level diagram of how the core components of our uh, payment forwarding work. In the middle, you have the HTLC switch, which is Sit, what sits in the middle and sort of manages all of the surrounding links. A link is like a connection between myself and a person who I have a channel with. And so uh, when I'm actually forwarding payments and I send the onion packets, they actually go out over these links. So it's the job of the HTLC switch to sort of be sort of like this financial router that is accepting incoming payments and deciding how to forward them out. Um, so for the life cycle of this HTLC, we'll start on, the, on, the, on your left with the blue line and follow it all the way through. Uh, the red lines sort of indicate where a packet can fail internally, and it'll just get sort of sent back and fail to the person like upstream of where it came from. And the green is actually like a, a successful response or settle. Um, you see a green line over there, that's when we actually s uh, receive a payment locally. So as soon as we receive it, we check like, oh, we have an invoice, cool, settle it back. And over here, we're actually getting like a response from a remote peer and then forwarding it back through. Uh, the key components here are the circuit map and the forwarding packages. Those are the primary things that were added here. Uh, the forwarding packages are mainly reliable with, uh, are, are mainly responsible for ensuring reliable forwarding of all of the packets internally within the switch. So if we, we basically like write everything immediately to disk, and then when we come back up, we can always know how to sort of resume our state. Uh, and it'll sort of aggressively make sure that these are pushed through and get to the outward links. Uh, the circuit map's job is a little different. It sort of sits in the middle. And what its job is is to make sure that there's, we never send a packet through the switch more than once um, within a particular like sort of loop cycle. And so it's, it, it has to basically handle like this job of like uh, managing a, a broadcasting messages between like M of M different peers. So like this is a huge like communication 
bottleneck problem, and so getting like a lot of efficiency there was pretty critical. So we'll start here with the circuit map. So whenever we get a circuit, or sorry, whenever we get an HLC, it's, a, it's, a, I have a, it's assigned a circuit key, which is a tuple of the channel and the HTLC ID. The HTLC ID is sort of auto increment uh, for each channel, so they'll just like ratchet up and we'll get them in order. Uh, and there's sort of like, the, when you're forwarding a payment, there's sort of an incoming key. So the person who forwarded to me will assign like some HTLC ID tied to this channel. And then I will sort of go through the circuit map and then assign it an outgoing key. And I will assign it sort of an HTLC on my outgoing channel that the remote peer will then handle. So the job of the circuit map primarily is to line up those two incoming and outgoing keys. Uh, the primary reason is that when the payment comes back across the uh, back across from the remote peer, then I have to look up like by the outgoing key, uh, where do I actually send this, or which channel do I actually send this back along? Like who was the one who originally sent it to me? And that whole process needs to be persistent because if it doesn't, then we might receive a payment and be like, oh well, I don't know, draw. And that's like the worst case that could possibly happen here because uh, black holing a payment is basically the worst case. If I send a payment and it just gets lost by the network or your node goes down and restarts and doesn't know how to handle anything or doesn't realize that it already had received this payment and just doesn't and just drops it, then that's just gonna sit there and time out until the uh, CLTV expires. So that's not that's not too great. Um, now, some of the big challenges here is that like some of the links may not be online at the time I'm actually trying to make this payment, right? So the semantics of like an ad, which is when you're going out and blowing the diagram this way, uh, are different than when you're going backwards. So when you're going out, it's kind of like a best case or best effort forwarding, right? If, I, if I'm uh, sending a payment and the remote peer is not online, I'll just be like, oh, they're not online, I'll send the bill back. Um, and so like that's a little bit easier. Um, but with the response, right, I need to make sure that always gets back. If I committed to forwarding this HLC and in fact did, then when I get a response, I need to make sure it gets back. Otherwise, that person is going to be sitting there waiting for uh, forever, really. <laughs> so that's one of the big challenges. It's also, uh, in between this whole process, the links can flat. So they might come, up, come, on, come online, go down, and repeat this process. And we've seen this online. I don't know if you guys have like, tested LED. You see like this, uh, a node will come up, set an error, go down. Come up, set an error, go down. Like, I'm sure a lot of you have seen that. Uh, so making sure that like all of this state can, stays consistent when that process is happening uh, is a big challenge. And really the big things here, like I said, are like reliable delivery and at most one semantics. And we have to do all this while at the same time avoiding a write for every single HTLC. Uh, because I can assure you, and it was tested, if you do it once per HTLC, you'll get a, like a throughput of about 10 transactions per second. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's actually like probably best case. So there's about three subsystems that I was working on where like uh, they all had to be kind of joined in concert to do this. And I, just putting one of them with like a singular write for Putting like a singular write per uh, subsystem or per HLC dropped the like performance dramatically. So doing all this in like a batched manner was hugely critical. Um, like I said, and then forwarding packages. So going back to our diagram, so the forwarding packages are internal to every link. Uh, as soon as we receive packets from the outgoing world, we sort of write them to disk. And like I said, that serves the sort of prim primary state in which we'll like read on uh, read again on startup to make sure that we reforward these internally. Uh, like I said, they all, they're all batched because, uh, and they're batched at the level of the channel updates. So when I do like a commit sig, receive, revoke, and act, uh, all HTLCs that are done or handled in, that, in those batches are all sort of processed atomically. And the reason is it kind of like simplifies actually the recovery logic when you think about it. If you actually receive a batch of HTLCs, but then actually process them individually, let's say I, had, I get a batch of 10 and I start processing the first three and then I go down. Right? When I come back up, how do I necessarily know where I stopped? It could have been, like, for example, especially with something that needs to be like a replay protection. Right? If, I, if I process three and I say, oh, those were good the first time, and I've written that to disk that they were good, then I come back up, and then I check again, and it's like I've replayed myself. So actually by doing everything in a batch, uh, making sure that our like, persistence logic is batched at the same level as like, the actual like, logical atomicity of the channels is actually a huge like, safety uh, feature, in my opinion, and it was also like, kind of necessary for the, from a performance perspective. Um, so basically, like when, when these forwarding packages, we only ever write to disk with these forwarding packages uh, in the best case. So w during normal operation, all we do is like write to disk. Everything's buffered in memory throughout the entire switch. Uh, and then only if like we crash, we actually have to like read and sort of reconstruct our in-memory state. Um, there are kind of a few edge cases here, because like I said, this is just kind of the flow of a payment uh, in memory. This doesn't include like all the actual like persistent restarts and stuff. So each sort of like subsystem has a bunch of like internal like recovery procedures and stuff like that. Uh, 
And so what, what, one of the cool things about this design um, is that because everything's only written to disk when we come up, or in, uh, in the process of like when we, when we are done actually with these forwarding packages, we can garbage collect them uh, totally asynchronously just by reading the disk. We read the disk, be like, oh hey, this one's done, like remove it, and we kind of do that like once a minute, uh, and that doesn't like interfere at all with the channels that can be done kind of on like a global level, passive level. So uh, basically the win here is that we're able to batch things heavily, uh, and that is a big win for performance. So moving on to multi-chain stuff, we, in this latest version of 0.4 beta, we restructured the data directory entirely. We now segregate, uh, ooh, segregated directories, I don't know. Um, <laughs> we, now, uh, we now separate like graph and chain data. So LND like, right now can support Bitcoin and Litecoin, is what it's configured for. Uh, we just added Litecoin D support, uh, which builds, I mean, it's almost entirely the same components as uh, the Bitcoin D backend. Um, but you know, each, each chain sort of has chain data that it needs. It might be headers, or if you're using Neutrino, it might be compact filters. Uh, and then additionally, each one has a wallet. So in the chain data, as you see, we, uh, we sort of store them by like uh, the Bitcoin, like whatever testnet, mainnet, subnet you're on, and then the actual data entirely. Uh, and then the difference between that and graph data is that graph data is sort of shared across all, uh, all, like, all possible chains you'd be listening on. Um, so like if, for example, if you guys saw the swaps demo, uh, all the graph data for both Bitcoin and Litecoin was all in the in the graph directory, whereas like they would actually have separate mainnet uh, or not mainnet testnet uh, BDC and LTC directories and wallets. So this is like a nice uh, separation of like just directories and concerns, um, and hopefully that gives you sort of an interview of like where or introductory uh, look ahead as to where this will go when we actually uh, incorporate like the full multi -chain, multi chain daemon support. Uh, so another cool thing is in getting prep and preparing for that, we implemented deterministic per chain key derivation. So uh, if you guys are familiar with the BIP32 key derivation path, uh, you know it goes per hardened purpose, hardened coin type, hardened account, uh, change, uh, like external or or child index. What's up? That's, that's 44. Oh my bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then yeah. So we so a couple changes that we made to support like the. Uh, configuration schemes that Lolly was talking about. We employ purpose 1017. Uh, shout out to Brick Squad, Waka Flocka. Uh, we use slip 44 for key derivation. So, you know, Bitcoin 0, testnet 1, like coin is 2. Uh, and then for all the key derivation, because we have different types of accounts, like, you know, the standard wallet might just use like a default account of 0. Uh, but, like, uh, Lolly added all this stuff to do, like, you know, the multi sig keys, revocation base points, payment base points, all these things. Uh, so we actually swap out the account for this key family sort of notion. And so this is nice because in the multi-chain setting, we can set the different point types, and we initialize one wallet per chain. Uh, you know, so each one of those get placed in its own chain directory if you're using LND in, uh, in that setting. Uh, those wallets can independently be rescanned and recovered, so I'm currently working on all like, the rescan logic so that you'll be able to just say, like, oh, restart LND, pop in a look ahead of 1,000 or 5,000 or 20, whatever it is, and it'll just sort of uh, drive keys, scan forward, looking for them and update your balance as it goes. And finally, the biggest benefit to all of this is that you can use one AEZ Cypher seed uh, and be able to like manage funds on all different chains. So, uh, finally, getting some more uh, onion routing packet construction. So uh, in this last version, we sort of optimized the actual construction process. So before, we had sort of a quadratic algorithm that uh, when you're processing like a path length of 20 hops, we basically do this O of n squared algorithm to actually derive all the ephemeral private keys and blinded pub keys. Uh, here are the, uh, like you can see the, the equations right here. Um, basically you can see that like, you know, you go from zero to I and then actually the blinding factors also extend from zero to I. But because they're like shared across all of them, we can cache them all. Uh, and the effects of this are pretty immense. Uh, so we saw an 8x speed up, dropping the time from roughly down to four and a half milliseconds on my machine. Like 75, 65 less memory, 77% fewer allocations. Uh, and shout out to Jimbo, is he here? Uh, well, he, uh, he wrote this up and then it was accepted to the, uh, the Bolt uh, LN spec, so now it's like the reference implementation for how you derive the onion packets, um, or at least like these keys. And then we have some benchmarks down here at the bottom, and then finally like just a comparison of the number of total like uh, scalar and base multiplications that you use to compute them, so pretty big savings. Uh, and finally, uh, now a part of this whole like HTLC switch forwarding process, or HTLC packet forwarding, um, is the ability to detect replayed Sphinx onion packets. So if I just take a, 
So the packets over the network, they come over in this 13, 1,366 byte onion blob. And I receive that off the network and I'm able to process it and get things like the uh, which hop I'm forwarding to, the amount, the timeout, seal TV, stuff like that. And if someone were to actually just intercept those packets and start replaying them to me, uh, it's sort of like a privacy leak because people can determine like, uh, you can see my actions based off, of, or the actions I take based off of processing the packet, as well as like, you know, someone might just process it again or whatever. So we want to prevent that as much as possible. And this operation has to be, uh, has to survive restarts. So if I like, if I send you a bunch of stuff, make you crash or DDoS you, come back up, try to send you the same things, uh, you know, you shouldn't be able to accept that or you should at least detect it. So the way we implement this is we implement a decaying log, which uh, when I receive this onion blob and parse it, I am actually able to generate a shared secret, one of the ones that's, uh, well, the equation isn't here, but yeah. Um, but, and then we hash that and take about the first 20 bytes and store sort of like a, a on-disk table of all those. Uh, then when, when these packets come in, I actually just compare against all the ones that I know, and if any are like found to be duplicates, we reject them, and, um, and then, so, so and then in, in that process, we, uh, we actually record in that batch which ones uh, were actually marked as replays. Because, going back to this sort of uh, example of when we were processing a batch of 10 HTLCs, and we get down to the first three, if we restart and then come up again, we might actually be replaying ourselves and not actually know the difference. So to prevent against that, we use this uh, I, a batch identifier, this ID, which is the short chain ID commit height. Uh, and we use that as like an identifier, we pass that in. If the batch has already been sort of tested for replays, we just return the actual like set the replay indexes of those packets. And we know off the bat that like, we don't have to do any more processing, that was just like the decision before and we're gonna deterministically replay that. Um, and yeah, like I said, this is primarily our protection against rejecting packets against ourselves uh, after restart. So, uh. <laughs> we'll answer any questions people we'll have. Uh, there any? Maybe there'll be a lot. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Just a quick question about the wallet architecture. Yeah. Um, the wallet that. Uh, like the addresses that you send funds to when you start, uh, mm -hmm. or when they when you sweep a channel, are those in the regular Bit44 path? Um, yes, for those we use Bit49, uh, which is like Bit44 base, and that's Bit49 is basically uh, an SP to SH, but we modify it to use a witness, uh, you know, like a native witness for the, for the, uh, um, for the chain address, and then we use, I think it's called Bit84, which is basically just pure uh, uh, witness key hash. Yeah. So you may have to like rescan for those when you have the seed for anything else. In your key derivation purposes, you list the multisig purpose. Is that just for the channel anchor? Or? Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's just for the funny job put it on. What? Do you have another use for it or something? Or? Well, you know, multisig and all that. Yeah, we can add this, like t seven, right? We can add <laughs> <laughs> You know. Using the same recovery words as uh, is traditional at this point, correct? Uh, currently, yes, but like with the way the scheme is, like the um, actual like enciphering is distinct from the encoding, right. so we can swap out recovery words in the future. So, so I, have, dictionary, I have a library where we went through a hundred thousand words to find the most memorable, um, most international words, and the only thing that's left in the thing is I need to do hamming distance. So that's right. just. So if somebody is interested, we can come, I'm, I've got like 80% of what's necessary for a much better word list. Cool, cool. Yeah, yeah, so it's version, so we can do that in the future if we want to modify word list or any other parameters. But yeah, definitely good job. Thank you. Oh, and uh, to add on to that, we can also do different languages as well. So you can translate the same sort of raw uh, encoded ciphertext into, you know, Japanese or whatever you need, so. Like French, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Can you just talk, I mean, we're in the early days of Lightning, can you talk about how you guys see the network growing and it being adopted? 
Uh, sure, sure, yeah. So I, mean, I think like we're in the very, very early days right now where we basically have a bunch of like enthusiasts who are like, very excited, maybe aren't really used to like running kind of like interfacing services. So like, oh, someone's like, you know, doing like a TCP have open attack, what do I do? Uh, so like, I think, you know, once we get back to the initial phase or uh, we're going to work on you know, ourselves with Lightning Labs, it's kind of like, giving people the educational resources to know how to like, operate a node, right? So like, you know, what should you be setting as far as like your kernel settings? You know, how do you want to like actually connect to other peers? How do you want to actually manage your, uh, your connections? You know, uh, as far as accountability. So we're going to do a lot of work to actually get, um, you know, the education with the node operators to basically know what they're doing, kind of like, you know, be a little more aware of the network. We also have planned this uh, UI for node operators to kind of like be able to like look at their node and like and look kind of like analysis what's going on as far as like, you know, payments coming in, how to optimize my channel, things like that. And then as far as like, uh, you know, merchants and a chain and things like that, I think we're in a phase where they can start experimenting with it like now, because I think, uh, you know, one big thing was for them to see kind of like actually like live on the network beyond like a testing, right? So now it's about mana over money. We're actually seeing some people already experimenting it. I think right now probably like bit refill is like the major, uh, you know, kind of like version on the network. Work, and people kind of like oh realize like oh I connect to them and I can like wrap everywhere else. So I think we'll also see different merchants come up and, and kind of like um, you know take advantage of that. One thing we've seen in the past as well, people offering like discounts for channel creation. So like oh you know open a channel to me and I'll you know pay the, like the opening fee or something like that, right? Maybe people will be incentivized to have like different lower fees uh, from the get go. But um, so I think it's kind of in a phase where people you know can like you know jump on early if you're early enthusiasts, but now it's kind of like the early days. People are kind of like still setting up the infrastructure. But then beyond that, once we actually see things mature a little bit more, I think you know more exchanges will come on because it's pretty cool things you can do with exchanges as far as like making them net, well, less custodial. You know, having kind of like a hybrid type so of like a channel and like push that money over there and actually create trade. But also maybe you know do like cross exchange arbitrage. So I have an account on two exchanges. I can send you know my Litecoin over here, sell it, send Bitcoin, and buy more Bitcoin. That's what you want to do, and then uh, do whatever else I want with it. But yeah, that answered your question. If you want more specific stuff. Uh, I'm wondering about uh, what the major attack vectors are on the Lightning Network. Uh, yeah, uh, attack vectors include, um, uh, you know, taking down nodes, I guess, which is why you want to, you know, like have multiple nodes for a particular service to ensure that you actually have availability of your users. Uh, other things you can do, which aren't like fully funded yet, or that like, you know, you don't necessarily need to be advertised in the network. You only need to do so if you're actually running a like a routing node, right? So me as a merchant service, I could basically just be on the edge, and not even advertise, you know, that they're on there. No one people that actually want to like route towards me to actually do uh, different payments can do that. Uh, other things include maybe trying to like spam a node with like very small channels or something like that. Or you can basically have kind of like policies that you know I need a channel above you know half a Bitcoin or whatever, right? So that kind of adds like a cost barrier to actually you know spam with all the state. Uh, other things include I guess doing things on the chain. Uh, you know, if you can kind of like, uh, you know, make the chain like super full or something like that, we can launch attacks. And then we have other defenses in that in terms of kind of like do kind of like a scorched earth approach where if you try to shoot me, well, I'll just send all your money to my recipes, right? And, and that's it. So there's, you know, like that's like the first step I do. I don't really care. I just want to basically have it to be like a strong deterrent for any cheaters to actually go against me. But most of you have any other ones? Uh, now I think about that, that pretty much covers most of it. But yeah, I'd say like availability is probably like one of the biggest things. So, um, you know, doing things like Setting, putting yourself in like a tour node, so you think like your IP isn't available, so oh, like you know. I forgot to add tour. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so this is, but also, <laughs> we, we, we have outbound tour support now, so basically, you know, I can be connected, I can connect, you know, using tour onto the network. Later on in the another version, we're going to add hidden service support as well. So now I can basically be a routing node, but not give away my IP address, right? So maybe that's even better now because they don't know, you know, that like I'm using Comcast and like Sabrina or something like that, right? So they can just know that like I'm in the world somewhere <laughs> instead. Yeah, it, it also kind of like depends on like what your definition of attack is, whether it's like, Inconvenience, or whether it's actually like full-on like exploits. So I mean, there's varying levels of like maybe all those, but um, in general, I'd say like the ones that are most practical would probably just be like inconveniences, but rather than just like full of exploits. So. Yeah, and I guess there's things that you know haven't really emerged yet. Maybe kind of like some like active privacy attacks. You know, people kind of like doing things like actively on the network monitoring links, so, like to try to like anonymize users. And then it become like a whole battle of like any sort of like privacy and So we'll see when that comes. Hey, uh, I'm curious how watchtowers are going to work for more intermediate uh, nodes, like um, people who have nodes on their cell phones that aren't specifically uh, routing 24-7. Gotcha. Well, you know, they wouldn't be accepting states from individuals, but you know, they would be exporting those states themselves. But also, uh, you know, I guess there's a question of kind of like the compensation uh, structure. There's a few different ones you can say oh, everyone does it for free because they're altruistic. They want money to exceed. They can accept all the states. We can do something else where maybe you may, you know, pay like some like small associate amount per state itself. But then also there could be a thing where it's like a bonus where if you actually you know act in sort of justice, then you get like you know 10 percent or something. Like that. That. So, but you know, ideally, uh, once you know we're on like mobile platforms, it's going to be all in the background. So you know, maybe like so, ideally, just you know, does it for uh, you know, nodes automatically. But maybe if I'm a power user, I can basically you know scan a QR code and make sure it's back to you know my Bitcoin D node as well, just like say keeping my cost or whatever else. Yeah. 
Yeah. Ideally, you might have like one or two or three, just so you can like also cross-reference them. And like when you come up, make sure that they're all they're they're all consistent with like your state when you went down. Uh, or if you lost something, you try to recover them. Like they're all telling you the same thing. Um, and that that should help. Like I think a lot of like the inconsistencies there. Yeah. What what might be your redundant and distributed basically? Because then it's like kind of like a one event thing at that point. But then, like you know, one thing we do within the current code base is we actually scale the CSV value according to the to the channel size. So maybe it's like a ten dollar channel, it's like you know, one day. But it's like you know, twenty k. It's like you give me a few weeks, you know, just to make sure things uh, don't happen there. So yeah. yeah. But I think uh, what you're getting at also is that once we have like more effective watch hours and stuff like that, and like node availability isn't like a, as much of an attack vector for like stealing your funds, then we can actually reduce those timeouts. And then like all the other like inconveniences, like oh my funds locked up for two weeks, aren't so much of a problem anymore. So. Yeah, so like as of some of the timeouts are kind of like on the higher side, that's because like it's new, so we want people to like, you know, be a little more cautious even though like inconvenience them, you know, that, uh, that much more. So try to be, you know, be grateful basically, right? So. <laughs> Hi, um, I was curious, it's a small detail, the, the macaroons, could, could you speak a bit more about them and uh, kind of what some use cases are and, you know, are they a feature for node operators or users? Sure, yeah, I mean, so like, they're very, very simple, basically it's just an HMAC, right? It's an HMAC of like a root key, and then maybe some authenticating data along with that, right? So because of this, you can't actually forge Mac root ever, and you can't go the other direction, right? So you're able to like attenuate it, maybe like, you know, add on like, you know, channel for one BTC on Monday, by kind of like hashing that down, and then I can still verify the root chain itself, right? So it basically has this like final digest, but then also, uh, you know, kind of like information on how to reconstruct that digest from the root Mac root key. And this, these are actually pretty used, you know, uh, like I think Google uses them pretty extensively now, anytime you actually, if you you can check like, your headers, you maybe have like back groups that are being used for them. And in terms of like kind of node operators, you can uh, you know you can have a setup where maybe the, your back groups aren't even on your node at all, right? Like instead you can basically dial them remotely and you have like a special back room for only a particular purpose, right? But then you know beyond that you can have kind of like monitoring service, maybe some like you know there's some kind of like metric gathering service that wants to see you know what's going on as far as node operators, you can give them that back to only you know collect that data itself, right? But then I think the other cooler aspect of where you're basically you do kind of like microservices type infrastructure where I can have you know uh, different distinct uh, instances that only do what they need to do and nothing else, right? So kind of like isolate, so, so you know, if they break into this, this box, they can only, you know, list my channels and maybe not actually make payments, things like that. So, so right now, like I was saying, we have an admin, which is basically all privileges. We have read-only, can only do read-only, and then we have invoice, basically make addresses, list invoices. But later on, we're gonna add tooling to basically let you do, you know, very custom macaroons. And uh, this can be cool in the future because you could say maybe we're on the kind of mobile operating system, and via intent, I can pass a macaroon, you know, to maybe like send a payment every day to some like, you know, can, can, like some like video game, right? And then only using the macaroon or via intent and pass that to LND, LND can execute, execute on there. So there's pretty cool architecture in terms of like, you know, having multiple different services with the same LND, but having them all, you know, have very like strict privileges of what they can do. I was wondering uh, what would happen if you sort of Sochi spam channel anchors? Sochi spam? Um, you know, during the Sochi Olympics, somebody was sending all these one Satoshi outputs. Oh, oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Oh, you mean if they just like made a bunch of channels? Or if, if people were spamming channel anchors with additional UTXOs, would they just get integrated into later commitment transactions? Would they as can you mean be lost or do you mean like making a bunch of very small channels or I think you just donate a, a third party spams you take so as to channel anchors? Oh, I see what you're saying. I mean, I, so I, I mean, they wouldn't be a part of the original funding output, right? They'd be just different outputs with the same address. So like you, like LMD may, may could spend from them, but it may not be worth it if they're only one Satoshi. Yeah. Also, <laughs> and then, yeah, you can later add like kind of like constraints and like what channels you will accept incoming. Cause, like to a certain degree, incoming channel is free. It's like oh, you want to put up like you know hundred dollars to me, like that's fine. Maybe you don't want like a ten cents output because maybe that's going to be dust in the future, right? So you can kind of like it's not implemented yet, but there's an issue of it on, on the GitHub. Uh, as much beginner issues by the people who want to actually do you know, development LMD. Um, that you know implement that basically like kind of like have more uh, finite policy on like what channel do I accept. Maybe if someone donated a lot of money, it might be worth it. But like yeah, the, the fees right. required to get your one satoshi back into your like wallet balance is going to be more than your one satoshi. So uh, another question about the watchtowers. I have two little questions. Is it are they necessarily trusted? Is there any way to like outsource it trustlessly? And then secondly, is there anything about it that's deterministic? Like you have the deterministic wallet structure. Can you like harden the keys that are used for relocation and then give like an X pub or an X prime? I guess the watchtower that kind of thing. Or do you need to Give them a key every time your channel updates. Gotcha. Yeah, good questions. Uh, what was the first one again? About, uh, are they, are they trustless? Yeah. Um, yeah. So like, you can say they're trustless because like you basically have them like do a particular action, and if they don't, as long as you have like one other one, they can do that action. Wait, could, could the watchtower like 
instead of returning the funds to you, sweep that channel to them? Oh, uh, no, because you know, I give them a signature, and you know, if they create another, another transaction, it's invalid at that point, right? So you can say, you know, I tell them what the transaction should look like, and you know, we, we use like Book 69 to basically ensure the uh, inputs and outputs are ordered deterministically. So I give them a signature, basically a balance information, and they can only do that, right? So if we say, okay, you can take 50% on, uh, you know, like justice uh, enforcement, then they can only do that as well. And you need to set that, you need to set that up in advance, the watchtower's fee, so hey, you would sign that all Exactly, time. so it's kind of like, we set up, we do negotiation, okay, you know, here's 20%, you know, I'll, you know, we do want to negotiate with a single, uh, single state, and then at that point, they can only do that action. So what they can do is just like not act, but then in that case, you know, you want to have these like being redundant in other places, and like, you know, it takes like one altruist to secure a bunch of things, and people like, you know, Bitcoin, so maybe, you know, they'll do that for free, you see. Um, yeah. And the second question was about. Uh, I think you kind of answered it. You'd, uh, have, you'd have to update every with every channel update. You'd have to tell the watchtower what the new. Yeah, but certain aspects are deterministic. Like you know, there's like a revocation scheme which uh, you know can let them compress the space into like log n rather than like having one for every individual one. And there's few, there's few different versions. Some involve kind of like you know using these blinded keys to ensure they don't know what channel they're watching. The other ones which we may go with, which is a little more kind of like you have like an encrypted blob, and I encrypt the uh, blob itself with half the txid, right, which you don't know. But if you see this part the half the txid on the chain, you have the full thing. You can decrypt it and act. And otherwise, you have to brute force it, you know, AES 286 or whatever. So, good luck with that. <laughs> Thanks. Um, great presentation. Uh, so, one problem I've had when spinning up Lightning nodes is figuring out who to connect to and sure. who to open channels with. Yeah. And especially if you're trying to receive payments. Um, getting somebody who's willing to open a channel with funds on their side. So do you have any uh, potential solutions or do you envision like how this problem will be solved in the future and like allowing people to figure out who to connect to? Sure, yeah. Um, you want to yeah, sure. Um, I think one of the things that will be like kind of under development a lot this year and in the future will be like further work on autopilot. Um, if you can imagine, I think there's like a couple different use cases that users might have. You know, you might be like specifically a routing node, you might be like a person who's trying to pay, you might be a merchant, you might, um, maybe an exchange or like whatever, there might be different sort of use cases. And so you can sort of think of uh, optimizing the select, like the attachment profile of autopilot um, based on like whatever your use case is, right? Or what you're trying to optimize for. And there might be different fitness models for which you are trying to like. Yeah, autopilot is, yeah, autopilot is uh, something Lolo built. It's basically like an automated channel maker. Uh, so it'll look at, so it, it can take like certain inputs, like, oh, did, you, did your wallet balance change? Uh, did you connect to somebody, stuff like that? And then it'll try to like look and see like, oh, what's a good channel to make? So like. Um, you can use different heuristics to guide that attachment, and so in the future, I think like if um, or, or at the same time, there could be like more like matchmaking services. Like people say, like, hey, I'm trying to like meet, like maybe we can uh, link up, and like there's an exchange for like making a channel or something, and like that's another way of going about it. But in general, I think like if you have uh, a more a more informed and like more optimized autopilot, then like a lot of these problems might go away because like hopefully you just make channels to like a better portion of like the network that you're trying to target. Yeah, it's so, like you know, the end goal is that you kind of like put money in a box and it just does it, it just works, right? Like we're not quite there yet, but like we're making tries towards that. And you know, the current one doesn't test that, and maybe some people will do that. Maybe it kind of like tends to like minimize the uh, you know average hop distance. Kind of like you know tend towards like a scale-free type network. That's what we're the environment level on test net. You know, we're going to be doing a lot more experimentation on that front. But even within the code base itself, everything is kind of like abstracted like an interface level. So you can basically add what's called like an attachment heuristic, right? Which has things like you know, do I have more channels? And then who should I connect to? And right now, basically, only uses data data in the ground itself, like I was saying in the future, we can also start to actually, uh, you know, put in signals from each individual channel, maybe put, like a channel fitness, and then from there kind of like call them down in terms of like what we should be doing. And the other thing about, you know, establishing kind of like inbound liquidity, uh, so I think, you know, we're, uh, there will be kind of like, you know, liquidity matchmaking services, where it's kind of like, you know, you can basically buy a channel for, for incoming, right? And you can say that someone wants to do that because if you're very popular, then maybe, you know, they'll be earning revenue right towards you, but you can also say maybe if I'm buying a channel, I can give you, you know, you know like a credit for like, you know, free 20 payments, like that, right? So it's advisor you also like, you know, having like out outsource transfers to me. So if you're a merchant, maybe you know you buy some input in that bandwidth because you compute kind of like what your total inflows will be on that day and what you need as well as there. So you can kind of like have a set of you know uh, you know a basically rival bandwidth itself. So it's it's like peering kind of but like you know the costs are very very low because you're kind of like opening a channel. So you just need some layers to basically signal your know, preferences and pricing and things like that and match people up. And then I think to, to finish up, uh, I think the last thing that would really help that as well is like uh, when we enable dual funder, dual funder channels. Uh, because like right now, yeah, you might be right, it might be hard to get someone to be like, hey, just put a bunch of money in this channel to me and nothing else, right? Like, but if you're gonna both put up some collateral and basically be like, oh, we're both able to like route keys initially off the bat without having to wait for the channel to normalize or anything, then you're gonna have a lot better time selling that, I think, so. What about like reputation of that? Like, is there a good, like, third party service? 
Yeah, possibly, possibly. And it probably won't be one of the protocol level just for like identity and privacy reasons, but like. Yeah, yeah you can tell, like, possible. Yeah, people want like uptime. You could even like compute, uh, you know, uh, real time reputation amongst your other peers. Like, okay, you know, every single time we send an HLC, it doesn't get canceled back from like that, right? So there will be, be some sort of kind of like metrics of like robustness. You don't want to connect to like a faulty peer that's only, you know, like has like, you know, one ninth of reliability or things like that. So if you want someone to open a channel, just call Justin. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like very funny, yeah. It seems to me that from your presentation, the uh, replay protection is built into the router of the switch, um, which will inevitably go to slow down the performance of the router of the switch. Mm -hmm. um, my stupid question was why we did that that way? And the second question is, can you actually move the re replay protection to the node, uh, to the edge, of, I mean, to the end node, instead of putting the switch router? That's where we increase the performance of your switch router. Yeah, so actually, that's actually how it works. So I didn't really get to where the actual switch replay protection was actually uh, put in that diagram, but it actually happens at the link level at the outer edges. Um, almost, uh, almost all of the logic in the switch was actually pushed out of the interior as much as possible, to sort of enable like the performance, as you were saying. Yeah. Um, the only, e even like when we're actually adding to the circuit map, because of the nature of the way uh, like incoming channels work, like when I'm receiving an HTLC and like I submit a batch to like the, the switch. Um, like the only person who will ever submit those, that range of channel IDs is that link. So as long as it itself isn't replaying them, it, like there's going to be no contention there. So those are actually all done in parallel, and then the only thing that goes through the actual center of the switch is just all held in memory. So um, I have two practical questions. Sort of, I was running uh, <laughs> Lightning D, uh, and then I was uh, running uh, LTCD. And uh, I was trying to just grab the graph and compute the number of nodes, mm -hmm. and it didn't match. Uh, I run them against the same Bitcoin node, and consistently, uh, Lightning D of the C++ implementation was giving me about, like, recently it was about 800 nodes, and uh, LTCD was giving oh, me about 480 or something like that. Is this on, on which network? Mainnet? Uh, on mainnet, both. Uh, so there might be a couple of reasons for that. Um, I mean, one is just that, uh, you know, there's no guarantee that you will end up seeing the same actual graph. It kind of depends on who those nodes are connected to and uh, what actual gossip information you're getting from them. Like, if, if, you know, it's sort of like an eventually consistent, hopefully, it's like a hopefully eventually consistent system. <laughs> but like, um, but the, like, like I said, there's no guarantee that you'll actually get all routing updates and they just sort of like come in as a best effort thing. The other reason that there might be difference is like depending on the level of validation that the different implementations are applying, um, you might actually be storing invalid valid like announcements or whatever on one while one is actually doing more heavy, heavy filtering, which I would guess is the primary reason, but I don't know yeah. for sure. So you know, like LND only accept nodes that have channels open, but if, if another implementation is a little more relaxed in validation, then you can see that the values be different, but also different implementations have different um, you know, policies on kind of like when they like garbage the channel. So it could be the case that like, there's a channel that's been there for like a year and like nothing's happened with it, we'll, we'll forget that, right? But the implementation may not forget that in the end. Like they should be around the same size, but also uh, depending on like you know your knowledge of private channels, you could have like a bigger graph and someone else they don't really know you know of the extent of what private channel backbone you could have, right? You know there could be some other alternative you know private network channel that no one knows about, but it's like used super heavily right now and it's kind of like this bridge via the public network as well. So, and uh, that that should actually like you know it, the ability to like garbage collect those old nodes is actually like really beneficial to like your routing performance and usability because. Uh, I mean, if you're spending time trying to route through dead nodes, that's just going to like increase the time and like the number of trials it takes to actually make a payment go through. So, so, so we'll, we'll prove it. I see. And the second question that could be just my ignorance: Is it possible? So, when you open a node, uh, when you, when you open a channel, you commit some funds to the channel, and is it possible to observe those funds being depleted gradually uh, at the level of network, or not, or you just see the event of closing the channel? Uh, network is like RPC or like peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, let's say RPC. Uh, yeah, you can, like, for RPC, you can, like, just pull the, um, it's like, you know, we have that forwarding events thing now, which basically will show you every single forwarding event in the channel. So, you know, you can use that to see, kind of, like, uh, what's happening. There's not yet a streaming RPC, but there will be one in the future. And there's also a list channels you can just pull to see what balance are, are being modified on. Yeah. 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 Okay, so say, I think you mentioned this a little bit earlier when you had the dust in the transaction, so a transaction that's super small. Mm -hmm. 
and then you're going through uh, intermediary node, and say, what if he goes uh, uncooperative or he goes silent, and then it, the channel is like HTLC lock. So you would have to have output for that lock, but if it's super small, you can't have that output. So would it be stuck there, or like how would that? Um, so like you're saying like like a desk uh, HLC never gets fully completed. Yeah. So we we yeah, won't okay. record that in the log. Like we only record things that you know actually get extended and then come back across. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. But then also you know no type like a dynamic desk limit. So I can say okay I only accept you know HLC above like two cases of shows. So yeah. I would not accept uh, anything else, right? Yeah. And then we can also do things around like you know ensuring that uh, you know our computer transaction is always always valid by consensus or by you know, by, by popular policy. Okay. So we'll avoid having a desk output there. Yeah. So, so it goes to my right now, basically. Okay. Yeah. So you kind of mentioned that you would have like a minimum transaction that you would have to have, like you couldn't have like a micro micro payment or anything like that. Uh, well, it depends. You know, certain nodes will say maybe like I'm a high value node, so I don't like uh, accept you know micro payments. Yeah. Other ones will say you know, I want that because I want the fees, I want the you know the frequency of payments to work well. Okay. Because like I wasn't sure if like uh, Lightning Network was supposed to handle like very very large transactions versus like maybe smaller, faster daily transactions. So yeah, we really, they can do both, and uh, you know we also have this thing called AMP, which kind of like lets you split a larger payment into like a bunch of like smaller payments. Yeah. Maybe if people have like smaller channels, you can still do like hundred dollar payment through a bunch of ten dollar channels, possibly. Uh, okay.